Now, some people have been locked in like me and survived, and they have no faith at all. They're just very positive people. And I thought greatly about that. And it, it's great to have positive thinking, but positive thinking can't make brain your brain reconnect. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it who's locked in. And I was told to think positive thoughts when I locked in. But and I must admit, I did try for a good two or three weeks, really think positive thoughts. Thought absolutely no change whatsoever. And one day I just thought, David, why are you even bothering? Uh, you know what's going to happen. So just relax into that. Because what I need to tell you from a faith point of view is the very first second I woke up, um, I believe I heard God's voice. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to the Recovery After Stroke podcast. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor or care for someone who is a stroke survivor or you're one of the fabulous people that help stroke survivors. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form, and as soon as I receive your request, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you and me to meet over Zoom. In today's episode, I am joined by Reverend David Hazeldean, who was 46 when he experienced a brainstem stroke that resulted in locked-in syndrome. David has written a book about his stroke journey called Don't Get Excited But, which is available to purchase online via the links that you can find in the show notes. Reverend David Hazeldean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Firstly, can you explain to me the difference between a pastor, a reverend, and a priest? Uh, the different denom denominations. So Catholics are priests, reverends are Church of England, and pastors are everything else than Baptists. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Baptist, Baptist minister. Okay. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Well, it goes back to Saturday, the 2nd of November, uh, 2019, before COVID was even a thing. And I woke up one morning at 6 a.m., just the prayers I normally do, and a bit of a headache on the, strange headache on the lower back of my head, and it kind of extended all over the front. So I I thought better of getting up to pray, and I kind of went back to bed after taking some uh, headache tablets. But I woke up then again about 8 o'clock, and the headache was still there, which I thought was strange. So I went in to get some more tablets on the way down, Went to Louis, and as I stepped into the toilet, uh, I had three really quick strokes, minor ones. One affect my eyesight, one affect my balance, one affect my my right ear a little bit. But it all happened in one go, and as you can imagine, it was very serious at that time. And so I, I staggered back to the bedroom and stumbled over my wife and said, so much not right. I thought it was flu or something, I wasn't quite sure. But... Um, yeah, that then the day progressed and it went downhill from there on. When you say minor strokes, did somebody explain them as minor? It sounds like a stroke, no. never minor. It sounds like they happened all at once. It sounds like pretty major. Yeah. Um, the the uh, consultant that saw my wife in the uh, uh, hospital uh, ICU unit said that she would not be having a chat with my wife that she needs to have about the end of life if it were just for these first three strokes but we knew nothing at the time mm. so they were that that mind it would just be adapting to life and dealing with them but they wouldn't have stopped me working they wouldn't have stopped me doing things mm -hmm. um so we just assumed that I might get better it, by lunchtime, I thought maybe it'll go away. But by lunchtime, I still had the symptoms 
And my son came into the room one point and said, Dad, what's the matter? Because I was supposed to be somewhere. And he was there too. And everyone was asking after me as a church leader. And so he came back wanting to know what the matter was. And I said, I don't know. But something's not right. That's all I could explain. Something's not right. My balance was off. I couldn't stand up properly because I kept falling over um, or back onto the bed, we say. And I just felt better just lying down. So... This may sound crazy, but it's important for the story. I watched the um, Formula One Grand Prix, watched Lewis Hamilton on, in Austin, Texas, uh, just to qualifying. And that will become significant later on when I tell the rest of the story. But after that, I was hoping that things would get better, but it didn't. So my wife rang the NHS other service here in the UK called 111. You dial 111 and you list your symptoms and they give you a rough guess of what it is. And they said it may be some kind of infection or something because it wasn't the classic stroke symptoms. So um, she put the phone down and rang for the 909 because we weren't really getting any kind of response. And because it wasn't life threatening, they took four hours to attend, by which time I just started to get heavier and heavier. And my speech was ever so slightly slurring. I didn't notice it, but my, my wife tells me um, Many years later, there was a little bit. But when they came and came in, all their, their bright color uniforms, their smiles, they did all my op ops tests, my blood pressure, blood, all the different things. And they said there was nothing registering untowards. So they said, we think it probably likely to be an infection. And they asked my wife, do you think you can get David to the, the uh, emergency, the, the ER? And uh, she couldn't even hold me, keep me up balanced. And so I couldn't even get downstairs. So I just shuffled down on my backside, down the steps, and left the church house in the area that I'd been ministering in for three years uh, in the back of an ambulance, holding this paramedic's hands. And then on the journey in the way, we had a nice, nice chat. Um, it wasn't particularly difficult. Obviously, things were disorientated, but I was under the impression that it was just some kind of infection. So we get to the, the ER and I walk into it. And there's only one time in my life that I've been to that ER. And it was the day before with an alcoholic that I was helping us. We helped get off the street and into a house. But, but he had had a, a relapse and gone in the day, day beforehand. So I knew exactly where I was. And as I entered the room, the chap on the admin desk said, are you David Hazeldean? Sam, my wife Sam had gone up to kind of um, guess in on all the paperwork, and I turned around to him and I wanted to say, "Yes, that's me," and I thought I was saying it, but nothing came out. And then suddenly, I had all this wet sensation on my left side coming up through my mouth, and I thought, "What is that?" And then I remember just blacking out. But the very last thing was, I remember hitting the wheelchair seat that the paramedic had brought behind me. And so, yeah, that was the last memory of what life was like beforehand. Yeah. So the first three little strokes or minor strokes, as they call them, mm. were caused by a clot. What were they caused by? Yeah, it was a clot, just an ischemic stro strokes. Okay. Um, and my, in my understanding, Obviously, the clot, it's a single clot, mm -hmm. and it got larger and larger, and it affected more and more areas. So, mm -hmm. um, But what made me collapse in the ER was the fourth and final stroke, which was, was the brainstem stroke. That was the massive brainstem stroke, and that's uh, what changed the game completely. Yeah. The brainstem stroke happened after your hospital uh stay when you got to hospital or when did it exactly happen it actually happened in the er i've been in the er uh -huh. room for about one minute so i do say to people in jest if you ever want to have a stroke have that's it right. in the ER. that's the right place because yeah according to my wife who wrote a chapter in the book that i've written she said all hell let's say all heaven being a christian broke loose so she was pushed out of the way and I was suddenly put on a, 
uh, trolley and my top was cut off, my trousers were cut off and they were administering all the things they need to administer. Um, and there's a chase all across London to various hospitals for various procedures to try and reduce that, that flot, it's the uh, thrombectomy. But ultimately that thrombectomy failed. And so they said, we want to send you to a, a hospital in London called St George's, which is just over on the west side of London. So we had to rush back in the ambulance, but I wasn't aware of this. And she was following behind in a, in a car. And uh, yeah, they admitted me to the neurological ICU. And I was there completely unconscious for an entire day. And I woke up on Monday morning to discover my eyes opened and I thought, you know, obviously I had, I thought it's going to be some kind of infection. Um, but I found out pretty quickly it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. So you had a brainstem stroke and that was the one that caused all the, well, all the challenges, all the problems that you're dealing with now, is that the one that you're recovering from the most, so to speak? The funny thing is, that is true in one sense, that I've had to recover all four of my limbs, my breathing, my mouth, my tonsils, everything from. That's all recovering, and the clock I've reconnected. But the one thing that gives me the real, real problems is my left foot. That didn't reconnect. Really that that needs a that needed an operation, and um, which will come to later in the story, I'm sure. But now it's the balance, and it's been diagnosed formally now as multifactorial um, imbalance intolerance. Bit of a mouthful with a mouth like mine. <laughs> so uh, because. So I feel like my head is like the English Channel or the Atlantic Ocean. I just feel like I'm on a, a sea, a boat at sea all the time. Uh -huh. And I'm learning learning to disbelieve that and trust the weight sensation that I feel in my feet, which is a very strange way to live, but it's becoming natural. So uh, I would say that those two, my left foot and my, my balance to the greater ones, the ear is minor and the eyes... Yes, it does make my vision look a bit w much worse because there was a, a blank spot in my eye. You, there's just nothing. It's not a grey spot or a black spot. There's just literally nothing. It's sight loss, they call it. But that has improved slowly, so much so that I'm I'm going to be starting to drive again in the new year. Start the process. So I haven't driven since that day in um, November 2019. Yeah. What? How old were you at the time? I was 46. I'm now 50. Okay. In your career as a reverend, how long have you been mm. in that role? Uh, I was 10 years ordained, but but before that, I was involved in church stuff as a volunteer since I was about 15. So I've been around the block quite a long time and involved in quite a few churches, doing different outreaches and ministries. Work for mm -hmm. local councils as community work, but always always engaging people with a passion, always trying to make community life better, always trying to help people. So my life is all about service. Priests, pastors, and reverends are front and center when it comes to people passing away, uh, funeral services, uh, helping people who are sick, unwell, etc. Yeah. And they're usually doing it from the front of the, uh, the front of the church, uh, behind the pulpit. They are usually the ones that are rallying the community to come around and support somebody mm. who's doing it, uh, who's doing it tough. In your life of forty six years before stroke, did mm. you ever consider that that person that needs the help? one day might be you no i mean that's the dichotomy the strange thing my whole life has been about helping people uh, we spent six years um doing lots of um social action social outreach just 
trying to help people with medical things, with uh, their income, with their jobs, with CVs, getting jobs, um, furniture redistribution, um, cleaning houses, access to benefits, all that kind of thing. And then suddenly, there I am, completely paralyzed and suffering locked in syndrome. And my literal every need has to be met. Even what I what I eat, what I drink, mm. needs to be met by somebody else. So, yes, it was a real, real change. It was quite ironic. And in fact, on the first Christmas day, I was still locked in this stage. And I remember thinking to myself, so this is what it's like being in the hospital on Christmas Day, because I've made it my business every day, or every year on Christmas Day, to pray for people who are not around the table with their family, you know, armed forces, people in the hospital, nursing homes, that kind of thing. And I've always tried to mean it from the bottom of my heart, but always felt quite shallow, that I didn't really understand, but I knew it's the right thing to do, and I felt passionate about doing it. And I just said, well, I'm thinking, this is what it feels like when you're that alone. Mm. your your job gives you a more philosophical approach to life i imagine if yes in, yeah. in one perspective you're you're probably philosophizing while taking people through their hardships while they are finding it difficult yeah. do you then find yourself in a position where you have to self philosophize well, and you have to find yes, a, a way through a really good question and i'm part of a number of strokes on the face uh, strike forums on facebook and one of the biggest questions there is why did this happen i don't deserve this what have i done to deserve it and it mm. it is a big question but if i'm really honest it never really bothered me why bad things happen to good people why mm. good things happen to bad people i my faith was born out of being a 13 14 year old and um, I had one or two significant encounters uh, in my faith with God, as I as I believe Him to be, and and that kind of shaped my my life. But I think around the time I was thirty, I thought I really better think about suffering because many people have questions. I didn't have any questions. I thought I'd leave it to to God; He'll sort it out, and He's in charge of everything. He knows. I'm not bothered about it, not not in terms of other people suffering, but I'm not bothered in the ultimate answers and the questions. But I then started for the next 10 years really studying it, or as you say, philosophizing about it, reading up on it, studying the Bible, listening to sermons and listening to YouTube things. So I would really come at peace with what I believe to be the answer for suffering. So when it actually happened to me, I can really be honest and say, I, I really wasn't bothered about it. I was really, I know it sounds strange to listeners, but from a faith perspective, as a Christian, the whole Christian faith is about living and overcoming life, overcoming all the difficulties. No one life is perfect. Bad things always happen, but being a Christian, you have a way of dealing with it and a mindset of how to deal with it because you understand the faith structure of how, how the world works. And my ultimate belief is that all these things happen for God to reveal his nature to humans. And there are one or two stories in the Bible where good people doing good things suffer for indiscriminate reasons. And through it all, they become more blessed at the end than they were at the beginning. And I have to say that's what's happened to me. My wife's job, our house, our children, where we live, where we're driving, what we're doing, who we know, how we, how how we are and everything has got better. So I'm not trying to be cheesy or classic. I don't need to try and put a spin on it. These things are literally just happen around us. So yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I feel in a strange way, I feel quite privileged that God has, I feel God has chosen to reveal, as I say, his mercy to me uh, because I've been safe in such a terrible circumstance. One of the difficult things my wife had to hear on that day, on, on the Sunday when I was um, in my coma, was she had to hear the, the consultant say, your husband's not going to make it. 
if he does, it'll be a 10% chance of survival. And that survival will look like 24 seven care in an in institute. Um, and it, but he probably won't reach that time and probably die from another stroke, which we expect in the next few days, because he's so weak fighting his chest infection. You know, if you lie down for a long time, you're not breathing very well and you get fluids affecting your lungs and then you get um, chest infections. Well, my lungs are paralyzed. My diaphragm was paralyzed. I wasn't swallowing. That was paralyzed. I had to have all my mucus in my, my throat sucked out. Um, like six or seven times a day. So I was evicting them straight away to all this um, different medical situations that threatened me. But after seven or eight days, the chest infection went away and I was moved to a hospital in Lewisham uh, in London. And I gradually began to be, become more, more and more stable and aware of my surroundings. So when I, obviously when I came out, uh, after 10, 10 months, I will come back to that because I had to change to a physiotherapy institute. But when I came out of that, after the whole journey after 10 months, I was desperate to find out about locked-in syndrome, desperate to find out how many people survive. And I can rem remember my wife explaining to me in the first few days of consciousness what had happened to me. And she kept using this phrase, locked in, locked in, but I can't find anything about it. So when I came home, I wanted to find out about it myself. And in, in the space of a few months, I managed to find around 10 to 12 people who had been locked in and had survived like me. But that was in the age of social media. And that was 12 people in the world. So that wasn't 12 people in the UK or in your nation. It was 12 people in the world. And I was really stunned by that. Throughout my whole period in the hospital, I had consultants and nurses and doctors saying, this is very surprising what's happening. It's wonderful. They couldn't say it's a miracle. They couldn't say you're going to get better. Mm -hmm. But they kept saying to me, one thing was you ought to write a book. And the other thing was this doesn't happen to many people. Well, what they meant was it doesn't happen to hardly anybody at all. Mm -hmm. In the UK, I found out that at any one time, there's about 400 people suffering locked-in syndrome. But of that, maybe one every four or five years like me will survive. And then even more years than that, they'll survive to a standard like I am. So... Um, Yes, it is quite a sobering thought when you think about what you've been saved from. That's why I kind of think about mercy and I think how merciful I, I've, I've, the mercy I've experienced and how I believe how merciful God has been. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Now, some people have, you know, been locked in like me and survived and they have no faith at all. They're just very positive people. And I thought greatly about that. And it, it's great to have positive thinking, but positive thinking can't make brain your brain reconnect. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it who's locked in. And I was told to think positive thoughts when I was locked in. But and I must admit, I did try for a good two or three weeks, really think positive thoughts. Thought absolutely no change whatsoever. And one day I just thought, David, why are you even bothering? 
uh, you know what's going to happen. So just relax into that because what I need to tell you from a faith point of view is the very first second I woke up, um, I believe I heard God's voice. Now, when people pray, they think that's totally natural. But as soon as you say, I heard God speak, that's like nutter, crazy. <laughs> He's weird. <laughs> He's going to blow up some people somewhere around the world and create a disaster. But I must admit, since I was age 15, my whole life of service has been founded on hearing God and reading the Bible and listening to him and just understanding his heart and what he wants for people. So I believe that that happened. In the moment that I woke up, you know, when you wake up in the morning and your eyes are closed and the darkness you can see is inside of your eyelids and you think, I'm awake, I will now open my eyes. And it's a split second of, of thought. And in that moment, I believe the words he said to me were, you're going to be okay. But that wasn't me saying, I'm going to be okay. I didn't know anything. I thought I had an infection. That was it. But when I opened my eyes with this, I'm going to be okay, ringing in my heart and soul, because it was such an indelible phrase that I didn't make up. And it stayed with me from that day to this. Um, I couldn't not believe it. I didn't have to think positively about it. It's like a, how do you describe it? It's like a flowing river, like a brook just it's bubbling It's a reality. Away. It's a fact. Yeah. I'm just conscious that many listeners will have no faith at all. Many will be spiritual yeah. and will be open to these kind of things. But I can just say what happened to me. I think um, I know lots of people. I think many listeners with no faith, I think, understand the concept that you're describing because the concept's not it's not a religious concept, it's a human concept. And I I was raised as a Christian. Don't go to church. I, I, it's Greek. My my background is Greek Orthodox. In, and and when you right, go to right, church, yeah. a Greek Orthodox church, they speak in, they speak in ancient Greek, Greek. ancient <laughs> Greek. I can understand. Oh, the biblical Greek. ancient Greek, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't understand it, and it's really difficult to go to church and get excited about learning, yeah, the yeah. scripture that right. way. And if you haven't done it by the age of forty nine, you know, there's nothing calling me to go and learn it deeper or further. And I, I, I know it enough that, you know, I can appreciate the idea of God. So when I had my strokes and brain surgery, I had the same feeling of, no, I'll be okay. I never thought about what I might, and I'll be okay regardless. I never thought about whether I will walk again. I never thought about the challenges I'm going to have to overcome or face or whether I'll work again or. I never thought about any of that stuff. It just did not enter my mind. And mm. I thought about death and that the fact that I might not be around. If it happens again, it might be the last one. And it happened three times and then I had brain surgery and then it, it wasn't the end. Um, and when I, when you explained that you had God talk to you, I, I had a similar experience, but I, kind of describe it as me, my internal self talking to me. And when people listen, mm. when, when I chat to people on the podcast about what I believe about God or what God is, I think God is me. I think I'm in God or God is in me. And, and there's not a separation like the church does my particular church and other churches that externalize God from me, the person. And yeah. What I always struggled with was if there's a problem, pray to God. And no one ever said to me, God is within you, is you, is part of you in a way that I would understand that what I'm doing is actually telling, having faith in myself, which other people describe as having faith in God. And I think that they're not separate. I think they're the same. And it's my weird way of accepting and understanding God, the God that other people um, have accepted and brought into their lives and um, praise for all their blessings. Mm. I kind of have internalized that and made it one with me. And I don't go around telling people that I'm God on the planet. No, no. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like, it feels like... Yeah, well, there's this, in Christianity, there's this massive 
mystery that's written about in the New Testament, where when you put your faith and you repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ, it's not just a second chance. It's actually what happens is you are born again. There's that phrase that people talk about, but it's actually a verse from the Bible. Jesus said, you shall be born again. Mm -hmm. And what it means is your spirit man is born again and that God comes to live in you. And the mystery the Bible mm -hmm. talks about is Christ in you mm -hmm. and we are in Christ. So, yes, I understand how you might use that language of um, internalizing things. Um, I can just say from when I was 15, I used to be quiet. I've got two ears, one mouth. I just thought I need to listen more than I talk. Mm. And if God is real, then he wants me to know him. And I must listen. And it was just a logical thing. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a blinding revelation one day. just grew in, up inside me throughout the years. Yeah. So this kind of experience happened. And I heard what, you know, in my heart, my soul, what I believe God has said to me. Mm. And I knew it wasn't me saying it. So when I opened my eyes, I thought, my thought was, why do, why do I need to know that I'm going to be okay? Mm -hmm. what, what is not okay? What's the matter? Mm -hmm. So I see all around me, the surroundings of a hostile bay, curtains drawn, and I hear the hush, hush tones of people around. And suddenly there's these two nurses, Australian nurses, speech and language therapists. And they said, David, we've been sent in to try and make contact with you. Now, that is like a phrase that an aliens would say. Mm -hmm. We are here to make contact with you. And I thought, why do they need to make contact with me? But instantaneously, because I didn't reply, I knew something was wrong with my mouth, and my throat, and my speech, my voice box. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, you've got had a brainstem stroke, and you've got locked-in syndrome, and we want to explain to you about an alphabet board so they then spent the next 10 minutes explaining to me what an alphabet board was showing me at the same time and how they're going to use it to for me to communicate and they basically asked me to spell out the words yes and spell out the words no get used to blinking and then they said right now we've done that do you have anything you'd like to ask so that's a time when anybody should say, I love my family, I'm not going to die, how bad is this? My question was, is Lewis Hamilton world champion? <laughs> because I had Important watched things. that, <laughs> but I had such a deep calm from those words I'd heard from what I believe, who I believe God to be, mm -hmm. that I was going to be okay, that Although I didn't fully understand what locked in was, mm. I, I knew I couldn't move anything because I tried to move my arms and nothing worked. And that is one weird sensation. And I felt like I was floating. I couldn't even feel the bed underneath me, mm. the sheets on top of me, all the sensation had gone. All my nerves had been cut off from the brain. Mm -hmm. I was totally laughing. It set my eyelids. I couldn't turn my head. I, I couldn't. I couldn't even make a clicking sound with my lips or fingers or I couldn't do anything to indicate to anyone. So when I did this full sentence, which took an inordinate amount of time to say, and in fact, I did, gave it a few short, tried to do shortened versions. Um, and they went back to my family and said, David's talking about a car and Lewis. And my wife popped up and said, well, we've got a friend called Lewis. And we used to have a car. We used to have a car with the registration that had LWS. Maybe that's, we used to joke, that's Lewis, our car. What is he talking about? So they went, they came back to me and said, David, we're not quite sure what you mean. So I thought, oh, no, I'm going to have to actually spell, is Lewis Hamilton world champion? Champion. That's going to take ages. And it took about 15 minutes to say it. But then they came back to the family and they said, Dave was asking, is Lewis Hamilton world champion? And my dad then burst out laughing. And he said, that's my David. So that was, a, I didn't realize at the time, I feel really stupid saying that. I should have said something like, I love you. I believe I've heard from God. I'm really peaceful. I'm going to be okay. Because they were very tearful. And my wife spent the whole week, I was nice to you, in a complete meltdown and uh, brain fog and confusion and 
been told by nurses he's going to die he's going to die and my kids were brought in to see me for one last time which i do not remember they were in tears as well and it was the world just was going slow for them mm. but the thing i said was east lewis hamilton world champions but that was in fact actually the best thing i could have said because it means i had a memory it means You're i intact. understood time yeah and i fully compliment us there they knew right there yeah you're intact um it's it's the it's kind of like a sign a small sign and that's a yeah. big sign when it's a, such a small thing it is a big thing for the family it's huge and like your dad said yeah there's my david you know that's awesome. right yeah everything was going to be okay it seems like you had what I would describe as a deep knowing, a deep knowing that yes. you were going to be okay. It's what I had. I had a deep knowing. I think that's a really good phrase. Yeah. 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 And that is such a powerful thing because there's nothing that you have to do about it. No. A deep knowing is something you do not have to do anything about. You just know it's going to work out. Things are going to improve. Things are going to yeah. change. No matter what you've got ahead of you, things somehow are going to take a turn for the better in some way shape or form you don't know what that looks like but you just have a deep yeah. knowing it's such a powerful state yeah i think you've taken the words right out of my mouth in fact when in writing the book uh which would don't get excited but because i'll tell you the story behind yeah, that because we'll it's chat about it in a bit yeah because it's due with the recovery and that's the title of the podcast right um but it, yeah, it was just so um, solid in my heart that I was going to be okay. But I didn't know how I was going to be okay. Would I have some kind of biblical instant miracle? Mm. Or would I gradually get better over time? Or were there going to be one or two quick things? So I actually uh, communicated with Sam through the alphabet board. Are we, gonna st are we still going to Cyprus? Because we booked a holiday to go in July. And I've had this stroke, the strokes in November and COVID wasn't a thing. So I couldn't quite grasp yet what, how bad was I, what was going to happen. Um, but yeah, that slowly revealed its time. So my discovery through the book was how I dealt with coming to terms with it's going to take a very, very long time to recover. And there'd be many rocky roads to, to follow. Mm. But ultimately you're going to be okay. Yeah. And that's the one thing that got me through everything. Yeah. Excellent. Let's go back a little bit. You said earlier that to good people, indiscriminate bad things happen. And then some mm -hmm. of those people will say, why me? Mm -hmm. What do you think is behind the why me? I'll, I'll give you a sense of some of it. I have an understanding that some of the why me is based on religious guilt god god has punished me there's a little bit of that that you hear from people they go yeah yeah they've picked up somewhere in their um experience through religion or through church or through stories that have been passed down from family members that god is going to punish people who do the wrong mm. thing and then somebody ends up having a stroke and they automatically believe that god is punishing them so what do you think is behind the why me and then how do we undo the god is punishing me thing because it's such uh, a yeah thing. there's two two things there. i think what's behind it is the cry it's it's not fair i think that the the amazing freedom i've had from accepting mercy and understanding about what mercy really means is that I don't deserve mercy, uh -huh. but I receive mercy. I don't deserve blessing. I don't deserve healing. I don't deserve the wife I have. I don't deserve the kids I've got because there is understanding in scripture that from the word go, man messed up. Adam and Eve messed up. And so the DNA was affected. Their health was affected. Their minds were affected. Their relationship with God was affected and death, we're told, entered the human race. Death was not a concept mm. when God first created the earth. And so when people say, well, God made me like this, well, that's not really true according to 
what Christians believe in the Bible. If you want to believe that, fine, that's up to you. But you, I think there will be struggles of when something happens that you don't think is fair to you, you'll say, why not? But if you take the Christian worldview that is taught in scripture, you start from the perspective that everything went wrong. You know God is good because he made such a great world for Adam and Eve, but they massively messed up. Um, and so the whole Bible story is a story of how God wants to redeem that. Now, as part of that, human nature is disobedient. So there, yes, there is punishment, but it's not my place to say to someone, you are being punished by God. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. So I can think of five, six, seven reasons why a stroke may have happened to somebody, but I can't say exactly which one. All I can say is, I know why I had my strokes mm, mm. because 10 years before the strokes, I was praying about something particular that hadn't gone the way I wanted. And it had not gone the way I wanted with three or four different geographical situations I've been in. But since I was a young boy, I really felt that something important and significant was supposed to happen through my ministry. And so in the, in the book I've written, the first chapter is called something's supposed to happen. Well, at the end of the chapter, it, it didn't happen. But then chapter two is something did actually happen, and that was the strokes, which, you know, a real curveball. But it all began to make sense. But what I felt God said to me at the time was, some people show their hand too soon. You know, if you're playing poker mm -hmm. or cards, you've got to hold on to your cards and take the risk. And when you wait, bide your time and get the right cards, you then land down at the very end, you get the most value from your chips mm -hmm. and you get the best, best hands. And that's what I felt God was doing. And he was going to put me in a position where he was saying, wait, wait, wait. And now I've got you where I want you. I'm going to do this in your life and I'm going to show how much mercy I have. And in the recovery and the story of it and the place I'm now going and the podcast with you and got some radio interviews coming up, and speaking engagement, I'm able to share about what I believe that mercy is. So, yes, I do feel that people live with a sense of, um, when I ask that question, a sense of basic injustice. Mm. Why is, I don't deserve this. But obviously the Christian message, you do deserve it. But the good news is that Jesus came to save us in mercy for what we do deserve. So otherwise, it's not good. It's not good. So I do feel that that's the that's what I would say to some people. Yeah, I hope that brings uh, something to think about for the people who are, are experiencing that. One of the most difficult things is to be supporting somebody or coaching somebody to get through their stroke recovery, and then to have them feel like they're being punished for something. Yeah, yeah, and um, and that's really tough. And if and I don't know if the answer for some of those people is say they have done something that's terrible that I don't know about, which is, yeah, which will be common. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is, is, but perhaps the answer is uh, ask for forgiveness and forgiveness is a general thing that people can ask for, whether they ask for it from God or put it out there into the universe to ask specifically from the people who yeah. you feel like you've wronged. Uh, forgiveness is a, yeah. an amazing thing to do. It's a, such a powerful thing. Now, I didn't ask God for forgiveness again, but I did ask for forgiveness. And I didn't have a actual conversation with the people who I needed forgiveness from. I yeah. just prayed for forgiveness from them. I put it out there and I made it a practice that I did for a little while. And I think I received forgiveness back. I felt like it had changed yeah. the way that I related to the relationships that were difficult because of the of the thing that I had done that made those relationships difficult. Uh, yeah, I think there are some many situations in the Bible where it talks about justice and for God not to uh, mete out justice would be abhorrent to the victims sin affects so many people's lives and not just the person who commits it but the people that it's committed against and you and i wouldn't like to live in a world where there's no police and we feel enraged if people got off scot-free mm -hmm. and so god's 
God's punishment is always linked to justice. Someone always deserves it for whatever they've done. But if you think you've never deserved anything, you're basically saying, I'm perfect. Mm. I don't deserve a thing. But we all know no one's perfect. And I, I think there's a bit of a struggle with that. So if you can accept in your heart, I'm not perfect, I need help. That's just a wonderful way to come, mm. Mm. come to God and actually ask for forgiveness, ask for mercy, and you receive such wonderful help because the Bible was at pains to say, how merciful and loving and gracious God is. But that love also has justice as a part of it. How can you love someone if you if there's no justice? How can you love your kids if you don't want the best of them? How can you love them if they if they if you let them get away with disrespecting you? It's all it's just about doing the right thing. How can you love your kids if you let them do whatever they want to do? I love my kids. I want to give them every single chocolate bar they ever want, every single ice cream they ever want. Am I going to do that? No way. It's harmful. Because it, it just wouldn't be the right thing. I like what you said about justice and that you know people wouldn't feel good if justice hadn't... People don't feel good when, justice, when they feel like justice is not served. That's and right. It's, and it's maybe then what encouraged me that feeling is what encouraged me to offer to ask for forgiveness because i felt like i had done an unjust thing to somebody right yeah and yeah. then deep down i felt like they had not received justice and that as a result of that 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 set un, sat uneasy with me and what i needed to do was make that right i made it right for me firstly by the sound of things but that also then makes it right for the other person. There's a win-win. Both people feel, um, one person feels like they, their unjust actions have been made right, so to speak, and the other yeah. person feels that they've been heard or justified or, um, or, or that I've seen the, the error in my way and then, and yeah. then that sort of settles the 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 feeling in my heart like you said and you really see how effective that was if you were to bump into that person mm. your attitude would be different your tone of voice would be different you mm. you may say sorry um there may be time for restitution maybe that person has died for some people but we just have to accept that when we talk about punishment in the Bible, it's not indiscriminate. It's not random. There's God is slow to anger. The Bible says, I was only reading a story the other day that it got took God 800 years to punish a group of people for something that he warned them for over the 800 years. And they still went ahead and did it as a group, a group of people. So, um, you know, he is slow to anger. So there's no, feel wrong that he's being indiscriminate or that he's random you know love has rules there is order there is constraint there is restraint but there is the law is laid down this is how the world works and if you do things wrong you will be punished but again there are many other situations where life is life things just happen mm -hmm. and we all have to deal with those too so it's not for me to cast dispersion and say this is why this happened to you. I just don't know. Mm. But punishment may be one of many situations. I had um, I had a, a bit of a why me moment as well, but not a why did it happen to me. I had a why did I survive and other people didn't. Yeah, what do you I, think? I had survivor's guilt. Right. So that was weird and strange because, of course, I'd never experienced survivor's guilt in any time in my life before. But I had to go to ther therapy about that and understand yeah. why I why I felt bad for surviving something that a lot of people don't survive. And then it kind of occurred to me that there's got to be more to the story than just surviving this. You don't just survive something like this no, and then no. just go back to regular life and do what you've always done and not learn from it and not support people who have been through something similar and not grow from it yeah that's problems. right and, and hey, this podcast is a great way of doing that right the podcast is the result of why yeah, me. Wonderful. wonderful i understand now why me because i've i had to share my story i had to find people who were like me 
that understood me so that I could let them know that I understand them. And then I had to create some kind of a community around us because there wasn't one. It was in the day before um, a podcast existed about stroke yeah. recovery. Um, and it was, it was the, again, it, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I had faith that yeah. I was going to be able to have this podcast and it was going to yeah, be that's right. and everything this lined happens. up and it occurred. Yeah. And, and then the, why me is still a question. Why me? Oh, okay. I know why, because I, I have to put out this content for people and I have to attract people to me so I can support yeah. them, help them. And I have to make it better for people who have had a stroke because one in four people are going to experience a stroke in their lifetime. And that's not a statistic that I enjoy hearing. And no, that means that there's going to be a necessity for what you do, David, which is raise awareness of a situation in your community where there's a problem and let's bring ourselves, bring, uh, bring us together so that we can all support yeah. the person who needs help. That's it's exactly quite, what it is. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of how I feel. Yeah. I mean, if we, we're going to move on from philosophy in a second, but I, I would say, yes, what you're doing is giving back. You're giving to people and that's the nature of God. You're demonstrating the giving heart of God. You may know it, you may not know it, but that's what you're doing. So there's an even greater purpose behind your podcast. It's not just the podcast mm. itself, mm. but it's what it reveals about God. He's always trying to reveal himself to us. He can't literally turn up, mm. you know, because we'll all die from his sheer glory. Yeah. But he's done that once in the flesh in Jesus and written a book about it. And so um the podcast has a so much greater significance in the universe as it were but i think these things whether you have faith or none i think one of the key things for my recovery was that sense of purpose i knew something good was kind of going to come out of this and that purpose kind of drove me on in my recovery which is a very active recovery and it engaged me a lot in a lot of physical work but that sense of purpose was able enabled me especially when i had to think about my instantaneous disability mm -hmm. and struggling with going through the stages of wheelchair an old person's walker a walking stick and now walking freehand with just a cast after an operation to to really accept that you're disabled and to have that sense of overarching purpose i i kind of feel that i'm not disabled I know I am. There's no denial. I mm. am disabled. Mm -hmm. I'm getting government benefits. There are things I can't do. I had to, I went on a plane to Cyprus recently and I had to take a wheelchair and go through a special entrance and then go on a car, which goes beep, 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 mm -hmm. as you go through the airport and everyone gets out of the way and then we have a laugh about it. But I needed that and I am disabled. But because I have this overarching purpose about mm -hmm. why everything happened and I had put it, purpose before the strokes anyway i just feel like it's an expansion a continuation of that and i think that's one of the hardest things in my period of rehab because i spent these three months after my icu 11 days it was spent three months kind of bedding down and, and, and recovering and just stabilizing in this hospital in lewisham and I started to show a few games where my little fingers started to twitch and my, my feeling came back all over my body that did some various tests and my, my right knee was able to lift up a little bit and my, my right ankle came back spontaneously within about two weeks. Just started working if nothing had ever gone wrong. So uh, they decided to move me on the 6th of January uh, 2020 to a rehab facility. Um, in Putney in southwest London called the uh, the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability and I spent seven months there in the first during the first wave of COVID mm. which was an experience all by itself mm. learning to to eat and drink and speak and get my fingers stronger my tendons had to work and it I put me on an intensive work work re regime like I was at uh, a college I had to start at nine and finished at five and I was helped to get into a wheelchair and got out of bed with a sling that seemed like a, a merry-go-round ride every every morning 
And then I was just doing various of the sessions with practicing standing, going through various uh, walking aids again. And gradually gained more and more independence until the final day came in about, uh, it was July, near my wife's birthday, July 3rd, when they said, David, we think that we can get you home without a care package, without anyone from the NHS caring for you. We think you can be fully independent when you go home. <clears throat> and that was just a tremendous lift because I was dreaming at that time that I would love to be able to walk out of hospital. Mm. It'd be so triumphant to be able to be rolled in the hospital in Putney there in West London, locked in, in locked in syndrome, lying on a bed. And I felt so, so heavy all those times because when you have your muscles don't work mm. and they're not strong enough to lift themselves, the big work thing that people with strokes struggle with, as we know, is the heaviness you feel and the sheer tiredness you feel at the end of the day. So um that that just got lighter and lighter. I mean, I still feel heavy now, but nothing compared to then. I remember lying on my bed once trying to get up, and I felt like my back was welded to the the bed, and I just couldn't get up. So one night I had this experience where I was thinking about all the things that people had done for me, all the caring that had done for me. People giving me medications and wiping my backside and doing my prayers for me. All my humility was. All my um, integrity, not my integrity, my, um, uh, I forget the word now, but self-esteem and all that kind of thing. The privacy was all gone. Mm. And I thought it's a wonderful camera receiving, but now that muscles are reconnecting and I can move little bits, surely I've now got to do something. And in my youth, I was a keen cyclist and athlete. I used to play football and I did weight training for a couple of years, uh, twice a day. And I just understood instantaneously in that moment in my mind, it's one morning, about five in the morning, I've woken up and I just thought, I've got to do something. And I started doing, trying to do sit-ups. And of course, I could only move my neck about two centimeters. But it took me um, until I was home, I said another two months. So in total, it took me about nine months to be able to do one sit-up. And that that is the length of, of time I've had to where I've come from, where I am. And I've carried on doing that rehab every day. And that's the key for recovery is to do big goal orientation recovery every day, about four or five hours in the mornings. Then in the afternoon I write and do do other things to do with uh, Christian ministry. Retired officially through ill health. But uh, that time in the morning is invaluable for me just get my left leg strong, my right leg strong, my, my stomach, my chest, my right arm. It's just fantastic. Mm. Now, it's just wonderful to see the weights dropping away and me not need them anymore and be able to function so wonderfully around the, around the house myself. I'm now able to cook myself food. Um, in fact, even the other day, my wife used to, she used to shower me uh, when I first got home. And for the first time, only a few months ago, I was able to have a shower myself. And, and I was able to get my right hand, uh, my left hand under my right arm to clear my right armpit. I mean, that's so huge, crude in one respect, so personal, but it's a massive, massive game. And I said, look, look, look what I can do, look what I can do. And I suddenly I realized, oh, I don't need you anymore. But the devotion that my wife has given me throughout these year, these years of recovery have been incredible. In fact, we do joke a bit and say, I'm the only husband who is working to get better so he can do chores around the house. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a list as long as her arms. So I'm now doing finances. I'm doing dishwasher. I'm cleaning the table at night. I'm making my own food and that kind of thing. But that the, the whole, the book that I wrote is all, you know, at the envelope of her devotion is what struck me when I came out was I joined the stroke forums on Facebook. They're in America and Australia and England. And I'm struck by the number of relationships and marriages that have broken up since stroke. I can understand it, mm -hmm. but it does greatly sadden me because when my wife and I got married, I was 20, she was 19. 
and we promised in sickness and in health. You know, we meant that. And that promise really came to bear from that November 2nd, 2019 onwards. And she has lived up to every moment of it in pure devotion. And it's been it's been really fantastic. I've had to help her in how to help me because mm. she wanted to do everything for me, which doesn't help you recover. Mm. So I said, look, I've been learning to ask for help and learning to ask for mercy. You've helped me. But now I need to, in a healthy way, learn to help myself. And I've got to struggle. And I need to learn to do these things. Things like putting your socks on, putting trousers on, putting T-shirts on. So, but her her devotion has been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. It is a massive uh, blessing, no doubt about it. Uh, with with relationships that fail, uh, often they've been failing before the stroke and the stroke's yeah. kind of the end uh, mm. moment. So that's kind of understandable. Often it's the problem is with the person surviving the stroke um, is in a really bad way. And the other person who is their partner is unable for their own personal reasons to deal with or manage that process yeah that's understandable too uh and it just i think it's opportunity for people to do more work and more and learn more about what they need to do to help themselves because if you can't help yourself you can't help other people and that's what i feel the situation is when people people's relationships end after uh after a serious health issue like a stroke because it's such a big job. It's such a big job to devote yourself to supporting somebody and to, and to therefore also then look after yourself while you're looking after somebody else. I think that's the hardest part that I see in people who are being cared for is their caregiver struggles to be able to care for themselves. Yeah. And that's not a good situation to be in. Uh, I think our difficulty has been, um, my wife has had to learn to, uh, romantically love me again rather than just be my carer so mm. she's officially my carer mm. as designated by the nhs but that is dropping away literally day by day mm. and she's learned to be my wife again mm. and learn we learn to have romance rather than just be an object of care but for the first if i can be honest 18 months two years after the strokes and i came home it was just about getting stronger and stronger, yeah. exercising, exercising. She just let me get on with it and encouraged me and said, you're great, you're great, you're great. Just keep doing it, keep doing it. And yeah. it was just the thing I needed. Yeah, fabulous. So you wrote a book. Somebody put this planted yeah. the seed. They told you you should write a book about it. Great to see it there. Don't get excited, but a true story yes. of deepening love faith and purpose discovery on a journey through utter devastation yeah. and um it's it has approximately no exactly it's 19 chapters uh yes how many pages the last oh it's about it's a standard size you can see the, yeah. the spine it's so that's a, a couple hundred read, pages so. a couple of hundred yeah it's yeah, it's about 250. 50. There's, there's 18 chapters of the story. Mm -hmm. The 19th chapter is just a medical a little two pages about what actually happened to me. Uh -huh. So just so people clarify, because the book doesn't major so much on exactly what happened, just in, in parts. Yeah. Um, but the real medical language that people will look up and want to know, because we all, the straight survivors, want to find out you know medically what actually happened to me that's the, in the last the last chapter about page or so but the reason it's called don't get excited but as a story behind this when i was learning to speak learn to uh speak the very first thing that to do the speech and language therapy to get me to swallow and i was not in control of my swallow i couldn't swallow and so they used to suction it out and i had this tracheotomy you, you can see but the listeners won't be able to see, oh, but yeah. I, I've got this hole in my neck now. And so they used to suck out the 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 fluid that your your mouth produces so much. I had no idea this was happening. And about seven or eight times a night. Um, and 
they're stopping you from drowning your own saliva, basically, which is a gross thought, but that was the reality. And I did actually become used to it. I became used to the sensation of drowning, which is quite sad. But because um, the first thing they do is they try and wean you off the, the trachea. And so you have this balloon inside your throat, which is trying to protect your lungs from having fluid in it. But they call it a cuff, this balloon. And the first step in the process is to go cuff down, as in deflate the balloon, and open up your airwaves to your saliva and see if you can generate any swallows. Well, I feel I felt very, very vulnerable. And any kind of trickle of saliva or any noise in the room or any joking or laughing or any any distraction would make me cough and choke. And my whole body would shake violently because I had no strength to control it. And then the physios who are in charge of that and speech and language therapist, they say, that's too much for you. We'll come back tomorrow or we'll give it a rest of days. And this was slowing down my recovery. So I would have to blink through the alphabet board to my wife. When I wanted to tell her something that had happened, that had improved, I used to notice overnight what happened in my body. I used to say, uh, communicate to her, don't get excited, but... So she would not laugh and not go hooray and not give me a round of applause or anything like that because that would set me off. She would just walk out of the bay, get excited, come back in. Then I'll say, don't get excited, but my right arm moves. Look what my fingers can do. Or well, my knee started moving last night. And that was how I was able to keep the rehabilitation going without her joy and excitement uh, messing things up. But that's why it's good, don't get excited, but... <laughs> That's so awesome. then we use we then use that as a phrase for other things so i would say don't get excited but i don't need my wheelchair anymore don't get excited but i've made my first phone call don't get excited but i can stand up all these different things now yeah that's exciting i like that i love the idea that her excitement was going to set you off <laughs> and you needed to her to be mild mannered and to act as yeah. if nothing happened so that uh you don't get triggered well we have this added thing that um one of the side effects of my stroke is that my brain has lost the ability to control its emotion so you may have noticed and listened and maybe had to hear me laughing a bit excessively sometimes yeah and um so it's i've got more and more control back and there are mental techniques i was taught by a psychologist during my stay at rehab to control it um, but it means also my anger is uh, very like a child throwing the toys at the pram. It's, I'm like a fifth year at my kid or crying. My son once showed me uh, the latest Star Wars film. My brother is a, a member of BAFTA and he can get access to various videos in the UK sooner than others can. And so I watched this in Lewisham Hospital where I was really paralyzed. And I started sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And my body was shaking. I was thinking, what is happening here? And the reason I was sobbing and sobbing was because good triumphed over evil. I don't cry on any movies because I know they're made up. But I'm, la I'm laughing and crying that the force beat the dark side. You know, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so that, that added to the don't get excited but thing in actual fact i would say also that's been one of the hardest things for us as a family to get to grips with is talking about this what's called emotional lability because it's an unseen but very real dynamic where the language you've had to start to employ is we call it it or the ability so i can't say sorry now for getting angry because i just don't have the control i can't you know say sorry for doing you may say a joke have a little chuckle and move on the conversation i'll have a fit for like 10 seconds mm -hmm. and it'll become really awkward and embarrassing so i'm learning these techniques and my family's learning them but we've had some quite difficult times of stress over it and that is one of the things that's affected all of us yeah yeah emotional outbursts i was angry uh then definitely crying a lot um and yeah, couldn't control it for quite a while. I'd be on stage and cry. Uh, but that was good because then that ropes the audience in even further and you make them, you make them, you know, yours now. <laughs> so that kind of, I saw it, I saw the fun side of that and I thought, okay, all right, 
I, I'm going to be okay with this if it happens. Uh, but yeah. it's the very first time it made me actually quite insecure. Yeah, because I spent my life speaking to large groups of people mm. up to a thousand people at a time. And I've never ever suffered from self consciousness, always been quite a confident, mm. bold person. But for the first time, I knew that I looked and sounded quite disabled. And I, I was a bit embarrassed. Yeah. So whenever I preach now, which is usually about twice a month in different churches, when I share my story, I have to say right at the beginning look at my wife. If you see her nervous, then you get nervous. But if she's casual, you'd be casual, like an air stewardess. You know, if you see them running around the plane, you've got to be nervous. But if, <laughs> if the plane is jumping up and down and they're just walking back and down, serving tea and coffee, just relax. Yeah. So I, like I say, that. get out your phone, look at the BBC News, listen to a, a song or something. Let me just gain control and then we'll just carry on. Yeah. And, and can I just say, congregations are fantastic about it, really fantastic about it, because obviously it's quite an emotional story mm. reliving this and showing pictures and videos. So, um, yeah, that's one of the things that has affected our, our whole family. Yeah. So the book has been out for a little while, or? Yeah. When did it come out? Uh, I must say, I can't remember the exact date. It was, it was like April time. Yeah. So we're sell we're selling copies around different churches that we go to in the UK, and it's available on the on Amazon for the Kindle version, obviously worldwide. Uh, you can also get the paperback version on Amazon in the UK, but you can get the paperback version worldwide through FaithBuildersPublishing.co.uk, and when you're on that website, you have to go to their shop. And it's uh, it, it comes up and you can buy it there, faithbuilderspublishing.co.uk. All right, we'll make in sure shop. we'll make sure that we get all the links and instructions from you so that cool. we can uh, put that on the show notes and people can follow that there. Yeah, great. It's been a very lovely chat. Thank you so much. And uh been really, nice to meet you. And you and I really appreciate your take on the whole God and stroke thing, because I think it's an important conversation that a lot of people uh, need to have. Uh, I think a lot of people will, some will find God and some will move away from God because of what happened to them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, whatever stage of their recovery, I, I hope that they'll listen to our conversation with curiosity and at least make them think about where they're at with their faith and with their yeah. recovery and um, what they have to do to change things if there's if change is necessary and um yeah from my so, point of view i just say if anyone's really desperate many people get desperate i struggle with ptsd and i struggle with suicidal thoughts for one particular moment in that recovery and we can get really low and things go wrong after recovery as well and I would just say, if you're that low and you have some kind of faith in God or some kind of a, a hope in the universe or whatever you might call it, just specifically say, God, have mercy on me. Discover the power of mercy and see things begin to change. Let him, let him help you. That's what mercy is about, helping those who can't help themselves. And God loves to help people. And on that note, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, the best, most important, most amazing way to do it is to leave the show a review on Spotify or iTunes. It's really, really important. It helps the podcast reach more stroke survivors who are looking for this kind of content and who will hopefully need something to make their recovery journey a little easier. So if you're watching on YouTube, comment below the video. I answer all YouTube comments. So I'm looking forward to reading the comments from people watching on YouTube. Like this episode and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. Thank you for being here once again and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode.
Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.